Um, I think we'll get started. So good morning, everybody. I know I know most folks here, but just in case, I'm Rabbi Jill Perlman again here at Temple Isaiah. Um, just uh, we're we're an intimate crew, so um, feel free to kind of just jump in as we as we kind of move through our our time together. Just to be aware of background noise, and so if you're not sharing or not asking a question, it might be good just to stay on mute, just to to help everybody sound out here. And I know there are a lot of folks um, joining us on the call, and then a lot of folks will be watching this afterwards um, as it's archived as part of our lunch and learn series. And so this particular series is what makes the Jewish home. All year long, we've been talking about all sorts of different topics from rituals around death, around, uh, we've been talking about holidays. We we did a session earlier called What is Zionism? These are all things that you can go back and watch again for, for refreshers. And this particular session is all about what, what it means to keep a Jewish home. And that is a wide ranging um, topic. So we're going to hit on lots of lots of smaller topics as we go. So I hope you will um, uh, kind of keep up as I jump from topic topic to topic. But again, feel free for folks kind of joining us on the later end, feel free to, to jump in at any time if there are any particular questions. And again, just that reminder about about mute. So what let me just ask, actually, let me just ask right here. Um, and feel free to unmute or put it in the chat, whatever works. What does it mean to to have a, what does it mean to make a Jewish home? I'm just curious kind of what pops up for you when, when I ask that question. Anyone can jump in. There's probably not going to be any wrong answers. There's no wrong answers here, probably. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll risk it and speak up. Um, it's to my mind, it's pretty complicated, and I tend to think of it in terms of the five senses. What do mm -hmm. I see there? What do I hear there? What do I smell, taste, and feel? And I think each of those parts of our human experience, there are Jewish elements to them. Oh, what a great answer. Thank you, John. That's amazing, right? How are different senses activating and 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 finding this? And it can be it can be a complicated answer. Great. Just want to make space in case anyone else wanna jump in. Oh, I see in the chat, hanging mezuzot. Great. We're gonna and that's what we're gonna start with is a mezuzah. I just want to make room just in case. Well, for for us it really started with when we had kids. Mm -hmm. Because I um my home growing up while we had Shabbat and Passover and Hanukkah, that was kind of it. And so there wasn't a lot of uh, Judaica around the house. And so when we had kids, that's when we started having that around so that kids yeah. would see that it wasn't just something that we did over there. <laughs> ah, okay. So that's just something we do over there, right? Something we do in here and that there can be, can there can be markers and these are affirmative choices that we get to make about what we want to place in our home. So what makes a Jewish home, um, you know, I, th I think what makes a Jewish home are the people who live in it, right? Is there a Jew living in the house? And I would say it's also the values, right? The values that we're living. Um, Judaism is portable. It's meant to be portable. We take it with us wherever we go. It's internalized within us, right? It's not just about what we do in the home. It's not about what we do in the synagogue. It's not what we do at Hillel, right? Um, these are things that we carry with us, but also the home that we have, right? That allows us to have some some concrete and um, and tangible markers that are meant to be kind of reminders about about our values and the way that we want to live, and something that will connect us, um, kind of across time. Right. Um, sometimes some are traditions that have been passed on for for gen many are traditions that have been passed on for generations and generations. Right. So it connects us through time and it connects us kind of horizontally, so to speak, um, to to people all across the world who may have uh, Jews all across the world, Jewish families all across the world who may have similar similar um, symbols. So I'm just going to I'm going to jump in with some of those kind of concrete and tangible markers and what they're supposed to um, help us with. So I'm going to start. Uh, I know we we read in the chat mezuzah. So I'm going to start with a mezuzah. So what is a mezuzah? So quite literally in Hebrew, it means a doorpost, but that's often not what we not what we mean, right? We don't mean the the doorpost when we say I'm going to hang a mezuzah. I'm not going to go hang a doorpost. I'm going to hang something on my doorpost. And um the mezuzah itself is that parchment that's inside, right? It's the cloth. It's the which which is just a kind of another another word for for our parchment, and that parchment has very specific verses on it. Now, sometimes we say mezuzah to mean the case itself, and that's 
not necessarily wrong, but what we're really referring to is what's inside. The mezuzah case is that um, is that item that is used to protect right the parchment from the elements because it's, sometimes it's on the outside of our homes. We'll talk about mezuzot that go. That's the plural of mezuzah. Mezuzot that go on inside our homes as well, but we can have one outside, and we want to protect it. Even the ones inside, we want to protect it from anything that's happening to it. Now, what's on that cloth? What's on that parchment? Um, is texts that uh, that are probably common to us if we um, have sat in shul, sat in synagogue, and sang the verses of Vea Hafta, right? Part of our Shema, which is about how you're supposed to hang it on the doorpost. It's kind of very meta, right? We read a text saying, hang this on their doorpost, and then we hang that text on the doorpost. <laughs> but of course, yeah, but of course, um, there's more. there's more to it than that. The text itself says, take these words, right? And the way we're going to bring them into our heart and we're going to put them on our gates and doorposts and, and, and our heads and hands and all these different things. Um, but these words can refer to the commentator's debate, the rabbi's debate. Does this mean all of Torah? Does it mean these texts? I, I take it to mean all of Torah, but we obviously can't fit the entirety of our of our of our tradition and text in that scroll. So we take this we take this smaller piece um, and we 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 wrap it up and we put it on inside. In fact, there are some very specific rules about how to write um, that piece of parchment, just as there is for other other texts that we have that are in scroll form. Right, it needs to be handwritten by uh, by a scribe. And it, um, and in fact, in this case, it needs to be rolled in a way. So when you open it up, you see the beginning. So I guess it's, um, I mean, so right to left is how you normally read it. So I guess it's rolled um, this way. So you open it up and you get to see that, you get to see the text right there. Um, and, you know, mezuzah serves uh, several functions, right? It's to remind us you know, to bring these words to bear, it reminds us that we are in covenant, we're in breach with God. Um, and also it's a reminder to who else? To ourselves and, and to other people, right? That there's there's a Jew who lives here. As Blue Greenberg says, a mezuzah declares the people who dwell here live Jewish lives. There's a custom, it's just a custom, it's not a, a rule, a law, but there's a custom, you may see people sometimes putting their hand to touch the mezuzah and then bringing their fingers to their lips as a kiss. And it's just kind of that, that like, I, I get, I see you, <laughs> like, I get it. I'm in connection with this. I'm in connection with this message. Um, and it's, uh, that's, it's, it's kind of beautiful. So as folks go in and folks go out, um, a few other, a few other pieces, just so you should know, if you've put up a mezuzah lately, there is um, a tradition there is that we're supposed to, to check it. And within seven years, it's supposed to be checked twice to make sure why you want to make sure that the lettering is still intact and, and you have it and it's ready to go. Um, so that's just something like if you have lived in your home for 30 years and you've put up a mezuzah, you know, 30 years ago, have you checked it lately? That might be a good thing. Check it out. Make sure it's still okay. And then uh, online or at a Judaica store like Afi Komen in Berkeley, um, new ones can certainly be purchased if um, if the need arises. So if you've had the opportunity to um, affix a, a mezuzah to a door frame, to a door post, then you probably know this. But let's remind ourselves together. Um, is the mezuzah like this? Is it like this? Is it like this? this <laughs> ah, yeah. So I get some hand movements there, right? Thanks, Eliza. So we get our hands like this. So it's usually diagonal. Um, and there's this, this funny debate. Should it be this way? Should it be this way? And this is a little bit of a compromise, um, but it's slanted. So it's tilted. Um, so the dominant way you would enter through that doorway. So say it's the doorway to my house, obviously, like the way I'm entering in, it is slanted towards the inside of the home. Um, and it's usually kind of around eye level. So it's about like a third of the way down. Obviously that depends on your own height, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's going to depend on door level. You may see around Temple Isaiah that we, um, have some, even though there's kind of this custom to put it there, if I'm a smaller child or I'm someone just of a smaller stature, I can't get all the way up there, right? It's a little yeah. further away. It may not be in my eye line. So you may know oh, that on a lot of doors and just, just a reminder for folks who may, um, just because there's some extra sounds if you want to want to mute unless you want to uh, jump in just to make sure we all we all can hear you may notice we put a lot of mezuzot mezuzas down lower as well so we we um and we're starting to implement that more across campus um but some at the this higher level so maybe more at an, at an adult standing level 
And then knowing that um, not everybody is for there. So we want to make sure everyone has access. So someone who may be in a wheelchair or, or, or shorter or a child, we want to make sure that they get access to that as well. Um, and uh, as you put it up, again, slant it on the inside. And, and there's a custom too, or there's, it is common. I know in my house it is, we have, we have a mezuzah on any, um, any room that is used for, for lifting, right? And if it's unclear, kind of the dominant way in or out, or you like, you know, just kind of, you choose one, you know, what's the, what's kind of, uh, you know, so for instance, if there's anything that has door posts, it may be from a living room into, um, I don't know, like another living space, right? It may be unclear which way you want to go, but, you know, just kind of choose one and, and, and go with it. It's on the right side um, for their dominant way in. Um, and it is not placed in certain rooms, though. You don't need it in, you know, a bathroom space, like a boiler room. I don't know if we do we have boiler rooms around here. Yeah, we do. So I'm just, I go back to my East Coast roots where it's always like in the basement. We don't really have basements here as much. Um, things like that. You don't need it on a closet. Um, but like on bedrooms, living rooms, um, and, and entrances to the, and entrances to the home. Um, and then there's a blessing. And... Um, I can put that blessing here into the chat just so that folks have it. But um, if you are preparing to hang your mezuzah, you can certainly um, ask us at any point. Um, but a very quick, you know, Google what's the mezuzah blessing. We'll get that in front of you. Um, but as you can see, I just put the transliteration here into the chat. It's that <laughs> blessing formula that might be familiar to folks. Um, around uh, and then it's uh, and then it's whatever your ending is. That's often where a new ending comes in. And in this case, um, it's likboa mezuzah, which simply means to affix or to hang a mezuzah. And it's the quickest, besides you know purchasing the mezuzah, it can be the quickest ritual that that gets you set up, right? And I started with mezuzah because this is the entrance to your home. So, you know, how do you want to be entering? How do you want to be bringing these values close and living that out from day to day? So I'm going to kind of keep moving through different topics, but if anyone had questions around mezuzah, I wanted to make space for that. Just jump on in if so. Otherwise, I'm going to keep on going. So another um, element that I think about when I think about what makes a Jewish home is, and I said this at the beginning, is what are the values that guide us and what are the actions that we take within that home as well? And then a concrete item that has to do with the value I'm about to talk about is the Sadaka box. Um, may, maybe also um, push maybe, maybe, maybe. at any point. Um, I know we try to keep our Sadaka box in a pretty prominent place in, in our house. Now, um, uh, oh, sorry. I just want to go back for one moment on Mrs. I see in the comments, what makes the inside of Mrs. a kosher? You see kosher versus non-kosher parchment. So I don't know exactly what a non-kosher parchment would be other than um, to be a quote kosher scribe. Um, you know, one is trained in that art and usually what we call is Torah observant as well. So um, it may just be someone's kind of um, certified, um, but I, I can look into that and happy to happy to talk offline about that. Um, oh, and Dawn, I saw a physical hand. So when I was at Alfie Coleman, they have their handwritten ones that are the more expensive ones, and then they're just printed. Oh, yes. And those are not kosher, but you can use them. Ah, yes, that is that is a really great distinction there. Thank you. That that helps a lot. So sometimes there are these photocopied ones or or printed ones in this capacity. Um and so again, are you going with the spirit of what it is, or do you need a kosher? When we later on, when we talk about kashrut and dietary laws, um, we will learn that kosher does not just refer to our eating habits, but you can have a kosher Torah scroll. You can have right now that I'm going to eat that Torah scroll, God forbid, right? But it's the idea that it is, um, uh, it is already, it is all ready to go in every capacity. There's nothing that's uh, kind of off in the process of either its cre creation or its maintenance. And so you can see it applies to this piece of parchment as well. Um, so I'm going to go back and talk, <laughs> talk about Sadaka and how we make the choices around, um, around how we give and what we give. So um, 
the root sadaka, you can hear this, right? It's it's the word sedek for justice. Um, if you know that, that the word justice, it's sedek. That's its root, righteousness, justice. And sometimes we uh, have it translated as charity, which you know I'm not going to necessarily quibble about, but that's not my chosen translation. Um, charity comes from the Latin word caritas, which is I don't know if I'm pronouncing that entirely correctly. Um, the Latin, but it means love, right? So charity. That would, that would make the assumption that charitable acts are motivated by love. Now, tzedakah, on the other hand, is, is its root word is not love, right? We have lots, we, ha, we use the word love all across Torah, all across our Jewish tradition, but instead we use the word tzedek. So um, it's about righteousness, justice, and it's going to um, instead carry the connotation of obligation. I'm not doing this because I want to. Right, I don't give because I I love giving or I love who I'm giving to, and I hope all of that is true. But that's not why I give, according to Judaism. Judaism says that you give because you have to give, right? And there, that's something a little bit different. Um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs uh, said, "What would be regarded as charity in other legal systems is, in Judaism, a strict requirement of the law." Right? So we can we see the difference there. We go back to the very beginning, right, to, to our Torah, to Leviticus, and we get some of the earliest forms of what we might call tzedakah today, right? So one of the one of the beginning, um, one, one of the most kind of famous lines about what it means to give is that you leave the four, from Leviticus, you leave the four corners of your field bare. Why? So that those who are um, in need are able to come and gather the fallen fruit or whatever it may be and to get those corners. And that's for the poor and for the stranger. And that was obviously assuming that at the time we were really built on a agricultural, we were built as an agricultural society. And when um, society began to, I guess, diversify, we had to put this into, uh, into a different context. So not just... Um, not just uh, we're going to now give these physical items that were part of our own kind of farming and um, and sewing and whatnot, but now I'm going to think about it as part of my salary or part of my uh, my income in some way of how I am going to I'm going to give, and so what we see over time is. Um, Jewish society very very early on began to create public funds, right, community funds to support any who couldn't necessarily support themselves in full. And that's becomes very popular, um, really kind of throughout Jewish society, <laughs> very popular in the Middle Ages and beyond. And today, or even let me go back like 100 plus years ago, um, very popular then. So we have, um, that's the beginning here in the United States of like our federation system, right? And federation is so important because it was, it's essentially the, right, it's a federation, it's pooling of funds to be able to support the community's interests. So in addition, and today we think about it as, as other interests as well, but in addition, it's to support those who may be in need financially. Um, we see it in other um other institutions, like I think about HIAS, which now just goes by HIAS, but used to be known as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which was created to help uh, Jewish immigrants initially. Now the now its mission has has expanded to help all of those who are, are refugees and asylum seekers and and in need in this way. But initially, just to help Hebrew immigrants, and as its name suggests, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and that was about pooling funds to be able to to give to them as well. So we see a lot of this throughout. Um, throughout our, our tradition. Food banks, soup kitchens, shelters, those are all really important um, Jewish institutions. Now, in terms of giving itself, one of the, you know, kind of most, um, I don't know, I use this text all the time with folks of all ages, but especially with kids, we talk about Maimonides' Ladder of Sadaka, which you may have studied at some point, but I'll just describe in detail. Um, no worries if not, if you haven't seen it yet, but it's essentially kind of describing like eight rungs of of giving, all of which are good. Because remember the, the giving, it, it's about giving in the end. So kind of the lowest rung um, is about when you give begrudgingly, right? Like, ugh, it's just an obligation. I just got to do it, right? I, this is, I got to make whatever percentage, and we're going to talk about percentages of income in a moment, but whatever it is, I'm just going to give it. I don't want to, I'd rather spend that on my vacation. I'd rather spend that on my kit, whatever it may be. That's kind of the, that, but that's still sadaka, right? And we're still going to embrace it and give because it's going to a great source. And then you kind of see different levels um, uh, going up. And I encourage you to look up Maimonides' um, like ladder of sadaka. Um, Maimonides is like 12th century uh, modern day Spain. 
but it kind of goes through um, a lot of it has to do with the identity of the giver and the receiver at different rungs, um, knowing that anonymity um, in many ways protects the the receiver or or helps to uphold their their dignity and also speaks to the motivation of the giver right and so as we go up kind of this um, like double blind <laughs> giving and receiving is kind of very close to the top of the ladder until we get to the very top of the ladder and the top of the ladder is essentially the Jewish version of um, teach a man to fish, right? As opposed to give a man a fish uh, to feed him, right? Teach him to fish and, he, and he's fed for a lifetime um, or however that goes. And so it's the idea of when, of getting someone to be self-sustaining. So they're no longer kind of in that that system of needing um, needing sadaka in quite the same way. So that's kind of the top. So we didn't go through every level, but I wanted just to, to share that um, this is a, it's not just giving, right? It's giving with intention. It's giving thoughtfully. It's giving in ways that are going to uphold the dignity and hopefully, again, um, help people to be self-sustaining in their in their own right. Um, a few other thoughts just about Sadaka and, and in our homes and what we're going to do. So I had said this earlier, you know, having a Sadaka box out is pretty important. Now, that's not often how we give Sadaka these days. You know, I'm not normally counting the coins and then that are in there, right? I'm going to probably put use my credit card or whatever it may be. Um, but it's like the visual reminder is important. And for those of us who have kids of any age or grandkids, it's a really great way to get the conversation going early and get them involved and active. So um, when we talk about Shabbat, this will come up too, but it's, it's it was customary to kind of empty your pockets at one point where you might have loose change. I don't know. I haven't carried cash in a long time. I don't know anymore. But you know, at one point when we were doing that, like you empty your pockets because you're not supposed to carry money on Shabbat traditionally. I'm going to empty my pockets right before Shabbat and I put that into the Sadaka box, right? Um, and for kids, it's a really great way to have them put in um, money, coins, dollar bills, depending on how it's how it's built, and for them to be a part of the conversation about where are we giving? How do we make the decision about where to give? How are we reflecting our values in the giving? And it could be really, really exciting. Um, I had two children become B'nai Mitzvah last year in our family and, you know, making the decision. So not just the little ones putting things in the Sadaka box, but, you know, what percentage makes sense out of, um, you know, for some of the cash gifts, so to speak, that were given to us? What, what, what are you going to give and where are you going to give? And giving and empowering our kids can be really inspiring, which means you also need to tell them when you are making um, Sadaka donations, Um right? Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm supporting this and here's why I get, we show up with our time, but I'm also going to show up with my money and it doesn't matter if it's this amount or that amount, right? And you could talk about amounts too, um, certainly, but just the act of giving itself can be, um, can really inspire and change and get the ball rolling for, for who is next. Um, so how much are you going to give? Let's, let's go into that. Um, Oh, I see a question in the chat. I just raising this conscious in a house with no kids. Um, you mean like so between adults? Um, is that the question? I, yeah. So I mean, I I think the Sadaka box still works, right? Just that nice physical reminder, but maybe making a time. So um, you know, again, weekly before Shabbat is a great time to, or a single person, great. So weekly before Shabbat, um, again, is that like kind of kind of traditional time to empty your pockets. But if that's not, you know, we're not dealing with coins necessarily in quite the same way. It could be like what a lot of people do this in December, right? At the end of the, because you're thinking maybe for some, some people, they're thinking their tax year, or that's when you get all the emails asking you to give. And that reminds you, or it's giving Tuesday or giving something, right? Today's camp day, by the way, um, I, I don't know if it has an official name, but giving to camp day, at least in the URJ movement, Union for Reform Judaism movement. So if you are so inspired, they're having like a contest and all in good spirit. Um, so, you know, today might be a good day to, to donate to camp. So those reminders, and it may be, maybe you want to set monthly, maybe you want to set quarterly. So about raising the conscious, like put it on your calendar. I'm a big fan of everything in life. If it means something to you, put it on your calendar, right? Or put it, how, whatever your system is. Um, yeah, great, great example, Rochelle. Yeah, so like before Rosh Hashanah, whatever it is, put it on there because it's probably not gonna get done if it's not if it's just living in your head, right? Even living in your heart, it's amazing until it happens, right? Um, you know, it doesn't kind of count in the same way. 
So what are the, what, how much are you giving? So in Torah, we talk about tithing, which is 10%. Um, so it's 10% of whatever you're, you're bringing in. So, you know, if you're making, uh, let's see if I, let's see if I can embarrass myself and do math, <laughs> not do math correctly. We'll find out. Whatever, you're making $5,000, right? That's $5,000, uh, $50,000. It's $5,000. You're making $100,000. It's $10,000. That's a good chunk of change, right? Given all of the different costs that are out there. So thinking about, you got to plan ahead is the point. So that's that's the number that's given to us by our tradition. Now, Maimonides, remember Maimonides from earlier, also known as Rambam, uh, he had that ladder. He actually suggests it's closer to 20%. He said 10% is the usual. Actually, his uh, exact text from, uh, from Mishnah Torah is um, he wrote one fifth, right? So 20%, one fifth of one's assets is the best possible way. But one tenth is the usual way. Anyone who has not given at least this much, meaning the 10%, has not fulfilled the mitzvah, the mitzvah of uh, around tzedakah. So he's suggesting we even step it up to the to the next level. So this requires planning. Um, and this requires at various points in your life, it may not be, it may not be possible. So what does, you know, what does that mean? And sometimes if it's not possible financially, um, how else will you give? We have so many gifts to give, don't we? Right? We can give of our time and our wisdom and you know, going out and physically volunteering and all sorts of different things. So um, I would suggest um, obviously the texts are around kind of the financial, the giving of um the corners of the field, quite literally, and 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 this tithing and community giving and everyone supporting the building of the Mishka and the sanctuary, right? There's so many different ways one can give. And in today's society, I would still encourage that, you know, at any level is great. Um, but again, recognizing the different, the different gifts that the different gifts that we, that we have. Um, let me just give you one other just piece of, um, of data, um, you know, around kind of this concept that to be Jewish means to give. So there was a 2010 study out of the University of Indiana that found that individual Jewish philanthropy in the U.S. exceeds any other group, right? So this is, I don't know, it's just interesting data because this is, again, what we teach our kids, what we teach ourselves, kind of what we hopefully are living in some way. Um, so it's it's very interesting, right? So, um, right, so that we're a giving group. And again, Another piece of data, this time via the Times of Israel, found that um, this and this data, piece of data came out in uh, 2023, reported that half of America's most generous philanthropists are also Jewish. So, you know, obviously we have we have learned we have learned Torah well. So from there, what I would love to um, uh, what I would love to do is uh, jump, unless there are questions around Sadaka in particular. So we've talked so far about markers, meaning like our mezuzah, this time our sadaka box. But again, it's really about the values, right? That both are are getting us to think about and, and act upon. Um, and a question two is 10% a calculation directly <laughs> related to the corners of the field? No. Um, so in other places, it talks about 10%. So it's kind of um, uh, giving on top of giving on top of giving. So <laughs> um, uh, so there are other places that talk about uh, talk about a tenth. So there are multi, and this is interesting because then again, there's a multitude of ways, um, kind of sharing that other point before, a multitude of ways that we that we get to give. Um, so what I'd love to talk about next is what is on our Shabbat table. So I mentioned before, right? Emptying the pockets, having that sadaka box kind of nearby is interesting um, and a great way to kind of link different values and ways of, of living our Jewish lives. Um, but also what are other ways that we get to celebrate Shabbat? And I'm going straight to the Shabbat table. Um, here's the really interesting thing about Shabbat. You can do it anywhere with anything, anywhere with anything. Um, meaning, you know what? You just got, you know, regular, you know, cups. Great. Use that. Um, you don't need a fancy kiddush cup. Don't let that hold you back. Um, that being said, we do have a mitzvah. Um, uh, we, we have this idea of hidor mitzvah, the beautification of a mitzvah, which is why you see a lot of beautiful artwork um, around ritual, Jewish ritual items. So if you have a special kiddush cup, bring that on out and use it. But you know what? If you don't or you know, you're just going to, you know, I will still make Kiddush. That means like say it's doing the blessing over any old cup I have. And that's just, just fine. Right. So something you could have in your home, 
And I, you know, I keep my kiddish cups and my candlesticks and all those things kind of on display, so to speak. They're in a very, they're not on display, like behind lock and key way off They're, you know, because there are often there items that are used weekly. So they're, they're right there, but I very can quickly grab them off the shelf and I have my kiddish cup and I, and candlesticks. And again, any old candlesticks will work, right? Meaning the actual candlesticks, the actual candles, and then the, the candle holders, the candlesticks themselves. Um, in our family, we have uh, passed down through my husband's family, candlesticks from the 1800s. Um, I mean, it's unbelievable. Every time we, you know, we've got to really clean them because they're pretty now, you know, dirty, which happens with these things. But um, yeah, every time we we light them, it's it's amazing, right? And it's connection. But any candles will work. When we travel, when my family travels and we have to be traveling over Shabbat, we have a little travel set. So it's just like little tiny things and we carry it with us. And it's not, you know, it's no um, no less special. So anything that you can do is fine. And, um, you know, challah is uh, one of the things that we do, some kind of braided bread um, in some type of way. And, you know, you can just cover that with a good old napkin, just fine. But also another way to add might be, do you have a special challah cover or something like that? And then you certainly don't need it. But those are all ways to kind of ring, make, make that dinner experience a little different from Thursday night right? A little different from Wednesday night. Friday, we're trying to trying to elevate here um, just a little bit. And as I think about what it means to what goes on my Shabbat table, I'm also thinking about other holidays and other, other times when ritual items come into play. And so having those nearby also on shelves or, you know, for us, we have our, you know, not everything fits. We don't have like a giant space. So I have my kind of my, my box and I pull it out at Passover. I take out all my, all my other Passover things. So that's where I, my Seder plate, other people display a Seder plate. Um, I keep my, we also have way too many menorahs. Um, I don't know, we're kind of menorah fanatics. We have like 10 of them or more, I don't know. But I'm not going to put 10 menorahs out of my house. Uh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah menorahs out of my house all the time. And so, you know, for others, they're going to, they're, they're just the way to display them. And other times they're in a box, but having a menorah on hand. Um, and again, can you make a Seder plate and just put things in a regular old plate and you put things on there? Yes. Can you have, I guess, technically, can you have just eight uh, uh, candlesticks and another one, uh, the shamash? Yes. Yes. Um, but these might be great items to invest in and display. And then when people come, right, you have kind of this flavor of Judaism all around you for others and for yourself. Um, another piece might be a Havdalah set. Um, and you can make, I travel, when I travel with our, um, I travel with our teens every other year doing a civil rights trip of the South. I used to travel every year with our, um, 10th grade at my previous congregation. And it can be hard to have a, like to bring, you don't want to bring a giant candle and all these things with you and spices and you can get the dog smelling things looking at in the airport, right? You can make it out of anything. You know, I usually will just go and, you know, in whatever hotel kitchen, is there something I can use that's some, some spices? And I can put, you can put two candlesticks, just like hold them together. I've done that on occasion uh, when I'm out there. So you can have something, but I, but in our home, we also have a Havdalah set that we use, which includes a braided candle and a space put those spices and um and again that kiddush cup can can double but we have a we have a, a cup specifically for our havdalah so this comes up in different holidays do you have the items ready to go so it's not that mad mad dash um i'm gonna uh keep us moving along um from there unless there are kind of questions about what are our shabbat items and of course what you do over shabbat um that's a that's a session in and of itself but these are the things um, in our home that will help us um, uh, bring really Shabbat into help us start off Shabbat so we can continue to celebrate Shabbat for those um, for those hours. So I'd love to talk next about Kashrut. So Kashrut is our Jewish dietary laws, um, like keeping kosher, but the word if I'm talking about it on its own. Um, the word is Kashrut. And essentially, it's kind of the laws around how we prepare and store what we eat, um, store our food, what we eat, how we um, slaughter. If if we are uh, animal cons consumers, right, we can we eat meat. How those animals are um, uh, slaughtered and prepared for for eating. So right, so the foods that are um, quote kosher are to eat are one things, and then the foods that are um, then we have something also called trafe as well. So that might be a term that you've heard. Trafe quite literally, like if I were to open up um, 
uh, you know, a Tanakh right now, a Torah right now, and I, I'm going to find kind of the text around, find the word uh, treif in our in our Torah, um, I would find that it meant torn. So it is what it's referring to, especially in Torah, are animals that have been um, usually killed by other animals, right? Or, or something kind of like the roadkill of back in the day. They have not been um, killed specifically for the purpose of food, of, of becoming food, right? And so the Torah quite rightly so says, don't go find that animal on the side of the road and eat it. Probably a great health um, <laughs> distinction as well. You don't want to just eat the thing that's been been laying out in the forest, right? Um, but that's what it means originally torn. It comes to mean over time, any of kind of the um, the animals that fall into in the non-kosher category. So again, you have the original meaning and then it kind of gets expanded in rabbinic literature to mean this this larger um, this larger category. So in the Torah, it's very explicit. Here, and some, some of the categories are a little more explicit than others, but here's the ones that are okay, or how you think about how to categorize the ones that are, are kosher, and here are the ones that are not. So, um, for instance, when we think of, of treif, just call it out. What are some treif non-kosher animals? I put them in the chat. What are the ones we know? What's probably the most famous one we know? Pork. <laughs> right, pork. No fish. Shellfish. Pork, shellfish, great. Birds of prey. Oh, birds of prey. Oh gosh, you guys, oh, you got it all. Fantastic, great. So when it, let's start with mammals. So when it comes to mammals, um, there are four animals that are specifically noted in Torah. It's interesting when they actually note animals and when they don't, what happens when you have an animal that doesn't fit in the categories, but they specifically note, um, and, and, and there's a couple different sections, but specifically in Leviticus, they're gonna note, um, uh um there's the the pig obviously but there's there's rabbit it's not kosher camel um badger rock badger is not kosher I, I haven't seen a lot of badger on the menus anywhere lately thank goodness or camels either but um but pork is kind of the big one and, and that's because it is consumed in a lot of other cultures and so that's why it's um probably known most especially to american jewry but um jewry kind of worldwide because it is a commonly consumed animal um, kind of across society. And kosher mammals are going to be those that have uh, cloven hooves and that, quote, chew their own cuds, right? So that's uh, cattle and sheep and goats and things like that. And giraffes, did you know that a giraffe is kosher? It is. Um, I don't recommend it. That would be a very, I don't know, don't recommend it. Um, trying to think of the, the, the shuk at the slaughterer and what they would, you know, where is the cut? What's going on? It does not seem like the right, the right thing. But Technically, technically it counts. So we talked about the mammals. Um, if we're going to talk about, um, I heard someone say shellfish. So uh, the Torah will go into detail around um, what's in the waters. And so if it has, uh, you can eat uh, anything from the water that have fins and scales. So that's how shellfish and kind of bottom dwellers, so to speak, right? Don't get to count. Um, with birds and fowls, kind of anything, um, it, it just, it, it's essentially what the rabbis who read it, when they look at the ones that are allowed and not allowed, they categorize it as someone had said birds of prey, right? So if it's a bird of prey or a scavenger, those things are are off the list. And, um, you know, there were animals that didn't exist or in ancient Israel. And so um, like the turkey, right? What like when the rabbis, they scratched their head for a long time when the um, when the turkey kind of came about is this animal uh, not came about, but when it was kind of discovered by by Jews and became like, is this, does this, is this like a chicken? Is it not like a chicken? What's going on? And so you have like a debate for a while. Um, you have uh, some commentators and rabbis saying, no, no, don't count the turkey, right? Because the Torah um, for, for birds would name the ones that you can't, uh, that you can eat, right? And so turkey's not on the list. And so what do you do? But eventually most, um, most rabbis lean on the, um, that it is allowed because it, it it doesn't kind of count in this category of a bird of prey. There's um, a lot of people ask why, right? And Torah doesn't really tell us why. Um, it's just kind of a law to be a law. Um, there are others who try to find some of the psychology behind it. Like you are what you eat. So we don't eat birds of prey or animals that we eat domesticated animals. We don't eat animals that hunt other animals or are bottom dwellers, right? So there's could be in that. Other people think it has to do with health. 
um, or at least well, how they understood health uh, standards of the day. In the end, it's just given to us and, um, and it's something that we can choose to take on. Now for this group of folks, um, oh, I, I actually missed the category, let me back up. Um, then what do we do with insects? Let me just share that category here as well. Um, so um, the text tells us of all of the war winged, swarming things, um, they are prohibited, except there's a few that are permitted. And because most of the um, most of the insect, most of the words that they use in the Torah, we don't necessarily know exactly what they're talking about today. So um, especially Ashkenazic Jewry just kind of bans um, insects outright, but you will find some um, other communities like the Moroccan and Yemenite community that allow, um, we, you know, it's the word for locusts. And so what kind of locusts they kind of go through or different kind of grasshoppers are allowed. Um, so it, it also depends community to community and custom to custom. Um, you know, speaking of different communities, because uh, again, I'm moving through this quickly, but if we were at a whole session just around Kashrut, you know, we would go into um, how different communities have kind of come down on particular laws and, and uh, Passover, for instance, is its own category, right? And so you have a lot of early Ashkenazic communities all the way until the, the present day and still, um, and still in traditional communities that don't eat something called kitniot. So on Passover, we're asked not to eat five grains, um, but then um, you have more fences around that. And so we, ca we call those, uh, which aren't the original five grains, like barley and spelt and wheat and on and on and on. But beyond that, we call that kitni oat. And so those, those are legumes and um, so like peas and corn and and peanuts and things like this. And so the rabbi said, no, no, to and rice, no to those things as well. Um, but the Sephardic community, like that was not their custom. And so in the Sephardic community, you would continue to have those things. Now, the conservative movement and the reform movement, um, I'd have to go back and check the year, but like 10 years ago or so, um, put out statements saying, keep me out, are good again. And I got to tell you, it's completely changed my Passover experience um, to, to bring rice back into the table. So um, this is one of the ones where knowing kind of the diversity of Jewish experience is important, depending on who you're bringing to your table and what's going to be most um, comfortable for them. Um, but let me just finish just, uh, I don't want to go too far into to Kashrut, except to say um, the other big pieces around the, the mixing of milk and meat. And if you are to be in a, in a home that, that where someone keeps kosher, you would have separate plates, right, for your dairy and for your meat. And then there's a in between, not in between, there's another category, parv. Um, of which is neither, and that can be that can be on either. And the reason why there are separate plates is you don't want there's this I don't know there's this idea of like transfer, especially via heat. Um, of can the essence of kind of meat get into the the, the dairy and vice versa? And so um, there's kind of a clear distinction and and separation. And I'm happy to talk more about kashrut with um, with anybody who. Who is particularly interested in in all of that? Um, just to kind of round out that section, um, you know, if you are a, a meat eater and you want to have um, kosher animals, that it, it has to be. Not only does it have to be um, an animal in the the kosher category, but they have to be slaughtered in a particular way, and also um, com the blood needs to be completely removed. And so the slaughtering process, which is around the neck, is is you know at the time was the most painless. Um, way and so it can be it can be a show of compassion that's maybe what we're learning from that but it's also a way to drain the blood um easily and then most meat needs to either be um like um roiled or salted or soaked as a way to bring you know if you're a person who quote likes your bloody steak it's not gonna not not kosher right so it's not just that a chicken is kosher it's that a chicken has been um uh, slaughtered in a very particular way and that there and 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 um, that there's also something called a hexure. So a hexure is uh, this is where you may see, for instance, on a product, a circle with a U inside, or it could be kind of a variation on a K in some type of way. There's a couple of different um, hexures that are out there. And what that is, is kosher certification. Um, that does not mean that a rabbi has come and blessed it. I mean that, right? I just want to be really clear. There's no like I can't just make something 
Um, I love all of my um, amazing interfaith partners, but I, it doesn't matter where, but I was at something um, where, um, you know, I would just say a leader of another faith tradition asked me to, to make it kosher. And I said, I, I, I no, that's not what I do. I can't make anything kosher um, just through my words or my presence. Right. And so when we talk about um, it gets certification because it ensures that someone has kind of checked the process to make sure none of these other items have, have come in, especially with a lot of processed food these days, you may think, oh, well, I have a block of cheese. Of course that cheese is kosher because what else would it be? It's a block of cheese. Um, well, actually many hard cheeses are made with rennet, which is comes from comes from animals. And so most many hard cheeses, it's very hard to find um textured um hard cheese as a result. There's some. There's some, but it's it's harder because uh, especially if you're a vegetarian and you may not know this, but you're vegetarian and you if that's the concern. Now that remind that that's kind of uh, bringing me into the category of how what do we do today? So um, some of us are living kosher lives, great. Some of us are 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 living Jewish lives where kashrut is not a part of our everyday activities, um, and so this is one way um, that we may be leaning into uh, what it means to have a Jewish home. Some of us keep kosher style, so. Um, just know that kosher style doesn't mean the same thing. It might mean one thing to me. It might mean something very different to someone else. So it's always good to clarify. For some people, that means like, I'm not going to eat, quote, high traif. Like there's no pork, um, but maybe there's a cheeseburger. And other people, that means there is no mixing of meat and, and milk. And for other people, um, kosher style might mean they have a kosher home, but when they go out, it's a crab fest right? And restaurants. So kind of checking in if that's something that's important for you. And for some people, this is, you know, who want to bring Jewish tradition into their lives. This might be, there are, you know, it could be trying to figure out what is the best, what's the best choice for, for you. Um, there's also something called eco kashrut or ethical kashrut that I want to bring to folks, um, into this this conversation. So there are many of us in the in Jewish spaces that um, in addition to kind of traditional Jewish law that is is something that we um, you know lean into and want to incorporate in our lives and bring to other folks. Um, are, are additional questions that are not addressed in our our, our traditional text. So for instance, um, is it okay to make kiddish over um, Meaning, uh, say the um, say the blessing over um, uh, over juice or wine, right? Um, is it okay to make kiddush for Shabbat over a pla using plastic cups, right? Knowing that that's contributing to how um, our our Earth is, uh, you know, to potentially destruction of our planet, right? Um, or am I buying from a company that treats its workers well and compensates its workers well? Is that a, is that a question I want to bring into my my kashrut process, my uh, and how I think about how what what I'm consuming into my body, or might think about you know are the if I'm eating an, uh, animals or dairy uh, you know are are they coming from a place that you know is organic or is it local right? Um, I know when I was living in New York City at the time this is like forever ago but. You know, we were we were maintaining a, a kosher home. I was vegetarian at the time. So, but my husband, but but he he ate meat, and um, you know, we were bringing in kosher meat. But he, at the time, even though in New York it seems like that's impossible, but he couldn't find organic local kosher meat. Now you can, but at the time, you know, twenty plus years ago, it was really hard to find kosher organic local meat. And he wanted to make a he wanted like, and we had serious conversations. Um, he would have, pre he preferred to have organic and local because of environmental concerns, um, and also, you know, supporting the local economy over having a hecture. And so that led to really interesting conversations. This was also right around the time of the downfall of agro-processors, one of the major um, kosher facilities in our nation, and kind of changed uh, changed cash route in general for how folks how folks think about that that industry. Um, and I'm happy to talk more offline about. Um, I have a lot of I have a lot of thoughts about the extra process <laughs> and what that looks like. Um, but for I want what I want to leave you with is be intentional. Right. And I hope as and you all make choices around the food choices or around how, around the food that you eat. Right. And what goes into your refrigerator, what goes into your body 
and um, and for Jewish tradition to be a part of that, that would that's that's amazing. Um, so bring bring Jewish tradition in, and I'm happy to share more. And maybe one day I'll do a whole session just on eco kashrut because as you can probably tell, I care a lot. Uh, I care a lot about that. Um, uh, so just some questions in the chat. Oh, so milk and meat, and why chicken? Chickens don't have milk. It's the most ridiculous thing, right? Oh my goodness, how can I? There, you can't boil the 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 text is you can't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Um, and you can't do that with chickens, right? So the original law is going to be around, not with fowl, but with uh, any mammals. And um, so, you know, cows and, um, and, and sheep and things like that, that give milk and goats. Um, but essentially the rabbi, the rabbis built a fence around this law in case anyone may, who sees you may think that you are combining meat and milk. It was really about the impression. So if you want to keep Torah law, around this, it's really just about um, mammal meat and milk. And if you want to, and and kashrut is really not just within Torah, but it's really kind of tied into the evolution of kind of rabbinic thinking. So rabbinic literature and further. And so that's kind of fences upon fences. And so that's why they added anything that's in that milk uh, or in that uh, meat category to that. So that's answering that question, Ellen and Carol. And then uh, liking the eco kashrut concept. Okay. Um, let's see if there was any other um, fruits and vegetables are kosher. You don't have to do nothing. No slaughter. Do check them for bugs because bugs aren't kosher as I shared. That's kind of the rule there. Uh, but other than that, and by the way, just because it comes up and feel, I feel like every medical drama that's out there, it's really about food consumption, not anything else. So yes, you can have the like, you know, pig artery or whatever, and you can play football with a pig skin and all those things. Um, it's not about, um, as long as it's not about your food consumption. Um, I could say a whole lot more about this, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going for time because there's kind of two other um, things that I would love to share in the session with all of you, unless there were kosher questions. Okay. So um, what's another way that we can mark our home as Jewish, bring Judaism into our home is through not just what we consume in our body, but what we consume in our brain and our heart. And so I'm thinking about our Jewish libraries um, at a time, especially when things have gone digital, I guess you could, I guess the library could also count with what you have on your devices um, or a podcast you're listening to or something like that. Um, but I think about what do I have on my shelf? Like, I'm also, what do I, what do I want to, um, I think about what's the, what's good for me. And also when people come, like, what are they, also knowing that I'm in connection with. So, um, you know, having a Sidor, so a Jewish prayer book. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks for whom, especially in the COVID era, um, when, you know, it's not just here that you come to pray and who wanted to have that close to them and didn't because it was something that they did at, at Shul and not in the home. So having a Sidor close for those unexpected occurrences or for your own daily prayer life uh, might be interested, interesting. Uh, the same with a Tanakh. So a Tanakh is a Hebrew Bible. Um, one piece of it is Torah. That's the T part. It's an acronym, the word Tanakh. Um, and so having a Tanakh, a Hebrew Bible. Um, and, you know, in case you are, um, in case you have your regular study, you want to, um, you can't get to the synagogue at 845 on, on Shabbat morning when we have Torah study here. That's okay, because you have a text um, that you can open up at home. By the way, you can also find all, all of the text online. Go to Safaria as, as, uh, as a favorite a favorite source. Um, and um, so having a, a Tanakh, maybe you want to have Haggadot. Right, so Haggadahs for Passover um, in there as well. Um, we have a ton, not that I'm the cook in the family, um, it's more Jeff in our life, my husband in our life, but you know we have a lot of Jewish cookbooks and Israeli cookbooks or uh, books by Jewish authors that are important to us. Um, this is personal, right? So this is personal, but I would say um, just as much as keeping our body kind of healthy and 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 can be a way that we're living our Jewish lives through our food, um, it's the same thing with what we're kind of consuming in our in our mind. So think about what's on your Jewish library. Um, what else can mark a Jewish home? I mean, it can be anything else, really. So I'm thinking about artwork. And I think Jack, you might have said something earlier. So like a ketubah, or someone said that earlier. I might not. I apologize if it wasn't you. I, I put it in the chat. 
You did. You put it in the chat. I remember, that's what I thought. I thought it was you. So it could be like a ketubah. So one of the first things you see as you enter my house um, is a blessing over, over a home. And it's right in Hebrew and it's right there and it's in English as well. And that's beautiful. Just as a reminder, is it a necessary thing to have in a home? No, um, but it, it can be a wonderful, again, marker. And then uh, and then um, for those who have a, a ketubah, which is a Jewish wedding contract or um, of a certain era, sometimes it's just a piece of paper or it just could be a piece of paper for anybody, um, but especially... Um, it, it, it is usually beautified in some type of way. So it can be on display. And so having a, um, uh, it's also one of the first things that uh, one sees as they enter my home is, is a ketubah. And it could be anything else that, you know, any other kind of artwork or, or anything that you want to, you want to bring into, into your home. Um, for us, I love, uh, I love khamsa. So a khamsa is, um, the hand of of God, sometimes like this, sometimes like this. Um, sometimes people think of um, a mezuzah or the blessing of our home or Hamza as some kind of amulet. Um, and there is kind of that history um, in Judaism that's um, especially a lot of, uh, you know, women had different things like the, wearing a bracelet um, or, or uh, an eye, like to ward off the evil eye or anything like that. And, and they're kind of seen as superstitious and anything seen as superstitious is kind of like pushed to the side in Judaism. I think we can reclaim some of these things, although um, just to be cautious, you know, we don't, we don't, um, we don't really ascribe any superstitious power to these things. I treat them more like reminders to ourselves. So when I have a, I talked about this at, at Torah study this past week, how I, I love the hubs. I have a lot of um, hamsas in my house. Um, and it's not because I think that it's, you know, that, that having that on my wall is giving me any more protection than anyone else. No, not at all. But I, I love to be, you know, I feel it every day, but I love to be reminded that, that I feel God's presence, right. And God's sheltering, you know, hand over me. And so it's just something that brings me strength and brings me comfort. And so I'd ask you, what is that for you? And sometimes it's explicitly Jewish work and sometimes um, it's not. So I love the Hamsa. Look, I don't know if you can see it from here. Giant Hamsa wall, giant Hamsa picture full of uh, Israeli artists. So I love to support Israeli artists here as well. Um, let's see, 1250, I'm going to stop. What, any comments or questions or what else makes a home a Jewish home or what makes your Jewish home, um, you know, meaningful, meaningful for you? Oh, and pomegranates too, Kendra. Yes. Oh, look, there's some pomegranates on my wall over there. Pomegranates love that, right? With this like fertility, but like abundance. And what does it mean to you? Yeah. The value of peace in my home is very mm -hmm. important, especially with a teenager. Um, so we try to really keep that front and center is the shalom in our home. Shalom in the home. Wonderful. Make space if anyone else has any lingering questions. There's, uh, mm -hmm. We have our ketubah that's been above our fireplace for our whole marriage, <clears throat> which was actually funny thing. Uh, the artwork, all the artwork, including the calligraphy is by my sister-in-law who was not Jewish and had never seen Hebrew before in her life. Um, and actually she had to start to redo it at one point because someone looked over her shoulder and said, uh, you're breaking the lines wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so nervous when the rabbi read it at our wedding. And he's like, yep, that's what it says. <laughs> But there's a line in it that we actually got from uh, some sample ketubot that the rabbi had shown us that says, um, uh, we have pledged to establish with you a home filled with loving, learning, compassion, and generosity. Love, learning, compassion, generosity. Amen, amen. We have um, the tefillah, uh, tefillah from my grandfather, perhaps even older. Uh, and um, and a remnant of a talus, I do not know. We assume it's from the same place, and I have the tefillah bag. And when we moved here, we just moved here a year, a year ago from the East Coast, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to lose those things, and I actually called up Kabad, and I said, what can I do? I don't I don't want to throw these out, and, and I don't want to lose them in the travel. And they told me, you know, that, that I could bury them or you know, bring it to them. They're actually very sweet, but we brought it here. And I was just looking around as we're slowly unpacking and I found it. And yeah. it's very meaningful to me to have that 
that part of the past in our house. Yeah, beautiful. So whatever these objects, especially prayer objects like talito, to fill in and um, and also if folks are looking for places for things to go, again, if it's um, if it's something that is uh, now like quote non-kosher, can't be used anymore and and you know can't be and, and it's not something you want to hold on to. Yes, so we we work with Sinai um, Memorial Home nearby and um, we do on we collect these items and you can bring them also let me know and we can take them at Isaiah and we um, we do bury them and there are certain times of the year when we bury them kind of, quote, in bulk. Um, and again, that's just out of um, out of honor, for especially for texts that have the word of, of God on them. And um, But there are also a few virtual items that you're not using. Um, there are some folks, especially in chaplaincy, um, who re have fi find new homes for people who are looking for, for ritual items to have in hospital and or other settings. So um, if you have them and supposed to just, you know, throwing them out, just let us, let us know. Um, but it, you know, especially if it's a family heirloom, keep it, hold it close, even if you're not actively, actively using it. Okay. Um, I have loved learning with you all today. And if this prompts any questions for you, do not hesitate to be in contact with me. And, um, and, uh, I, I look forward to all different ways that we continue to make our homes meaningful, um, Jewishly meaningful, and of course, meaningful in all sorts of different ways. So thank you and have a great day, everybody.